Welcome back. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Worldwide, the countless exhibitions and art shows have been canceled or postponed due to COVID-19. But now that the threat of a pandemic has become a reality for people from all corners of the world, and who knows for how long. So how can creators of works of art, the artists, help in the global response? What inspirations can we get from them? As the coronavirus forces us to endure an unprecedented time of social distancing, how do artists and audiences cope with the new normal? Bearing all these questions in mind, I paid a visit to 798 Art Zone in Beijing and talked to artists and curators there. We are all in this unprecedented experience of a global pandemic. While we are trying to struggle with the uncertainties of daily life, we also try to come to terms with what the new normal means for all of us today and possibly forever. That's why we come to art for rescue, for guidance, and hopefully even some joy. Right here in downtown Beijing, an art exhibition, Meditations in Emergency. Hopefully, there will be some answers inside. All these artworks were created before the big pandemic, but they managed to speak to us in a different way now, thanks to the exhibit curators who presented them in a new light. While doing the rounds, Vivek Kinari, the director of the UCCA Center for Contemporary Art, gave me his take on why these works are up for another closer look. Now this artist, Oliver Larrick, based in Berlin, um, very associated with this group of artists in the early 2000s, 2010s called post-internet. So they were the, really the first artists to start thinking about you know, how much of our lives we live online and uh, what that does to our minds. Um, but here he's, he's creating all these connections, visual connections between different forms, um, morphing, right? Things turn into one another. And what you really have is, uh, I think what's interesting to note is you go from human to kind of non-human figures. So people aren't the, the protagonist necessarily, you know, turn into a dog or a horse, and back into a person, and on and on. Because really this, this whole section of the show, these artists in this part, it's the middle kind of pivotal section, are all in one way or another exploring the relationship between human and animal. Yes. And actually we are just part of the world, the, the animal world in a way. Of course. And this is one of the, again, like lessons of the pandemic, right? I mean regardless of what you think about its origins, we know that this virus is found not only in humans, but in other strains of animals as well, right? So it's, um, I think we definitely have been forced to reconsider our, our place in this ecological system. And yeah. For artists like these, we also see them and their works in ordinary days, but now it's a very different layer of what they're trying to say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, this, is a, this piece is a great example of that, right? It was made a, long before the, the pandemic, but, but yeah, if suddenly we reconsider this context and these relationships, and it just takes on a whole new meaning. Exactly. I know you have a lot of other works to show me around. Sure, let's yeah. keep going. Okay, okay great. Good. Zhang Pei Li, you know, is one of the real heroes of the Chinese avant-garde. Sure. They call him the father of video art. You know, he was the first person to make that kind of work back in the 80s already. Um, but this is a much more recent project, still before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, last year, he started going to um, Carrara, you know, mm -hmm. the quarry in, in, in Italy, where Michelangelo and all the great sculptors of the Renaissance got their marble. Mm -hmm. um, but actually what he did is he, he took a CT scan of his whole body and then using 3D printing created molds based on this and then and then basically so these, are, oh, this, these are his bones oh wow yeah basically or like life-size images or replicas of, of his own bones if you put it together you'd have a whole skeleton of John Pelli. of John Pelli. <laughs> more about him than you ever want to know yeah but um no I think I, I love this piece because you know while death and mortality are such common topics in in art you know going back through the ages right um, but for him to encounter this so directly I think during this pandemic, you know, all of us thought at one point or another about our own mortality. And these are the interesting. Yeah, so, 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 you know, here you have the bones and then there you have these uh, solids. They represent the, the same weight as the amount in his body 
of uh, fat, of, of blood, and of water. So they're, you know, these materials, crystal versus marble, different weights and densities, so you need a bigger size. But he's, you know, it's, very, it's a very precise exhibition. He's trying to um, represent himself in, a, in an honest and systematic and scientific kind of way. Philip showed me around and introduced me to Zhang Hui, an artist who has a unique eye for people in uniforms. Now his old works about nurses are shown in a different light. That's fascinating, not only to the audience, but even the artist himself. Some special environments, like hospitals, airports, these places have professional characteristics, not an ordinary environment. I think it can be analyzed and researched as a subject using the method of drawing. So I created this work. I saw it was painted in 2018. This time, we see the efforts that a lot of medical workers have done in this epidemic. Do viewers have more empathy? Because a lot of media are reporting the dedication and sacrifice of medical workers, many people find these works resonating with them emotionally. At this special time, this exhibition uses such a presentation to consolidate the multidimensional and multi angle thinking from several artists to reflect on the current special situation. I think it's particularly good. This kind of empathy makes people feel they are indistinguishable from each other when they come here, and the part between the wall of the museum and the outside world is eliminated, making it a huge museum. As an artist, do you think there is a great relationship with the pandemic, your life, your work? Many things I thought it was an analytical reality before, but now it seems that the reality is a personal assumption and a little illusory. This epidemic has brought me back. It turns out that reality still has so many dimensions and so many things that are usually shielded. This outbreak suddenly makes things more real. After experiencing the epidemic, my thinking is more real than before. I will slow down myself and chew on every piece of my work. I will study every piece of work again and again. I don't want to be rushed or reject experience. I want to be as comprehensive as possible. Philip, good to see you. Great to be back. Meditations in an emergency. Frank O'Hara, wow. Yeah, um, I mean, so obviously a great American poet of the mid-century. Um, he only lived to be 40 years old. And actually during his lifetime, he was more famous as an art curator than as a poet. He was a curator at, at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art. And, you know, his poetry is so beautiful, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but he, he uses ordinary language. So it's almost like pop art, you know, but in, in, in poetry, in literary form. Um, uh, some of his poems, there's one, there's one called Having a Coke with You. Um, but, but, of course, Meditations in an Emergency is the name of a poem, but also of uh, a collection of poems that he published in, 19, in the 1960s. Why is that phrase? so much what you wanted for this exhibition. <laughs> Nothing's canceled, but everything's postponed, right? Obviously, it's not a time to make a show with a, with a big budget, with a big team coming from abroad. So we had to suddenly think of a new exhibition to, oh, to reopen with. And you know, what else is on everyone's mind right now but the situation? I mean, it would have felt wrong to do anything else, anything else a, a so-called normal show in these very abnormal times. So. What was really great about it was it gave the team a chance to really use their, their minds and their eyes and their sort of curatorial muscles. So I, I basically put them in a room and said, you guys have one week, you know, so let's come up with a proposal. It gave us a bit of advice. I'll take credit for the title, uh, nothing else. Uh, the, the selection of the artists, um, the presentation, the design, it was really all done by us. Uh, the six-person curatorial team, very outstanding young Chinese curators, but so many other people uh, from the communications to the design to the production that get involved. And it was really a chance for us, you know, this, there's this Frank O'Hara quote about in times of crisis, 
you must decide again and again uh, who you love, right? And not just who you love, but kind of what you love and who you are. And, you know, it really makes you confront these big questions. And many of their works actually is pre-2020 January. Almost all of them. Almost all of them. And yet they have very new significance now. Absolutely. Did you open a new eyes to things that you have not noticed before as much as you did now? It's not, a, it's not like you're choosing the winner of a prize. No. It's, you're thinking more just how can I put things together in a way that's interesting, that will make them appear in a new light, and that will bring out their connections uh, to this present moment. Because, of course, with such little time, no one's making a new piece of art, in very few cases. I mean, maybe one or two pieces are brand new. The rest are existing. Even um, the paintings of Zhang Hui, you know, these two nurses wearing masks. Actually, it's the same nurse, and of, of this nurse with her mask. It's actually from 2018. But, you know, put in this time where we're all wearing masks all the time, it takes on this new significance. And I think that's, that's the thing about important art, is that it can mean something different at different times. Its relevancy is always there. Absolutely. But it takes eyes to discover those relevancies. And it also takes echoes, you know, among the curators and artists at a different time in order to find those relevancies. And of course, yeah, and it's a conversation. And we're always, you know, maybe we would approach an artist and say, we're very interested in this piece that you made. And they would say, well, actually, OK, I see what you're trying to do here. Because we had a document just kind of explaining our concept. And they say, actually, this piece, I think, makes more sense. And we would say, aha, uh -huh, you're, you're right. Which one did you, did you discover during the process? <laughs> So there's a wonderful young, um, uh, he's originally Lebanese, I believe he's based in the UK now, called Lawrence Abu Hamdan. Um, and he made this beautiful video where he's talking about walls. And we, we were thinking of him in all kinds of different contexts. He was one of the winners of the Turner Prize this, this year. It's a very important prize given by uh, the Tate in, in London. And, you know, at this time when, you know, our, our American president has spent four years trying to build a wall, um, and when kind of borders are suddenly more important than they were before, uh, this, this meditation of his about what is a wall kind of started to seem quite important for this show. This is really what I want to ask you about the so-called new normal. We all have to deal with it. We all have to form it in a way. What is the new normal that you can describe verbally to us as a curator, as an art institution director? You know, I mean, I've been very lucky. I've, I've worked almost my whole career in China. I'm American, as you can tell, or as you know. Um, and it's been amazing to watch the, the art scene develop here and to watch it become so international. Even in this moment of different kinds of tension, I think it can show what's possible. Um, and it can allow us, allow our viewers and our, our different stakeholders um, it can, can be a way of reminding ourselves that there, there are these possibilities for a different kind of understanding. This piece of Amiko Lee, um, and it's actually really this very serious meditation about um, his time in a hospital. He had a skin problem, and so he was studying in, in the U.S., and he spent all kinds of time in and out of the hospital. Uh, he made this environment. We'll go look at it. I mean, I'll show you, but it, you look around, and... Um, what it's become known for online are, you know, there's these kind of very fun red arches and this blue carpet, the colors are dramatic, and there are these elements from like Chinese traditional medicine, uh, you know, mannequins scattered around. But then you look on the, on the walls and it's this kind of photographic essay about his illness and recovery and all these different questions that that raised. And that's one of the sections of the show is really talking about, you know, how the pandemic kind of brought us all into closer relationship to our own mortality. And our own body. Our own body, yeah. Our own life, in a way. Indeed. The other thing is how people are wondering, we are learning, listening, feeling, touching, smelling, all these senses. How are our senses are opened up as a result of a totally new normal these days? I guess in the art world, it could be also a reflection of that. I think... Um we just become so much more attuned to our immediate environment. You know, and that, that's the first section of the exhibition. It's called this, The Fragile Everyday. And the inspiration for that was really this idea that we were all going through at one point where you know, people stayed at home for 
one month, two months, in the case of half people year. in Wuhan, almost half a year, right? And, and never leaving. And so suddenly, on the one hand, you know, what you thought of as everyday routine before completely upset and uh, re rearranged. And on the other hand, you have this like just incredibly deep relationship to, to your surroundings, the people around you, uh, and the th even the objects and the spaces that, that are around you. Um, and that's a, that's a very artistic process. You think about artists like Bruce Nauman, who was an important American artist from the 60s, who made these videos where he would just walk around his studio kind of in a circle again and again. Or I think about the uh, Taiwanese-born American artist, Xie uh, Ching, Te Ching Xie, who, you know, in the 80s in New York was making these pieces, like he made one piece where he lived for one whole year in a cage, yes. or where he punched a time card every hour for a whole year. So I think these kinds of... Um, There's a whole series of works related whole series, Yeah, to not in this show, but I mean, yeah. you know, artists have been guides for us um, to be with themselves. To be with themselves and to think about kind of, you know, putting themselves in kind of very extreme circumstances and situations. That's always been something that, you know, modern and contemporary artists have done. Are the artists, or is the art world the fortune teller or the historian? Wow. In other words, do they know more than we do before it happens, or do they only in conclusion, trying to draw us to something. I, think it, I honestly, this is going to sound like it's such an easy answer, but it's really both. Because I think artists, you know, their job is to see things. And that's what they do all day. And so it's kind of natural that they can sometimes do that before the rest of us. Um, so many times you see uh, ideas that kind of come to the fore in, in artistic production and that later kind of make their way into the broader society. I mean, think about like uh, American artist Adrian Piper, who did a lot of really cutting edge work about identity and race um, and stereotyping and these things. You know, in the 80s, I was already talking about these issues. You look at the work now and it, f it feels like it was made yesterday, you know, in the context of all the recent um, yeah. events in the US, yeah. At the same time, you know, why is it, it was just one thing I did during this period was kind of rewrote our, uh, our values, like of, of our team and of our institution. And the very last, you know, sort of item, I mean, I ask myself, you know, why, you know, I, I, I could have been a journalist or done all these other things too, right? Um, but for me, art is so convincing because I think when we're all gone, a few hundred thousand years from now, you know, it's, and we look back at previous civilizations and what's really left to us, you know, of course, um, some artifacts and, and, and things, but it's really the art, right? It's really the way that we are able to understand the people who came before us. So, yeah, working with artists is such a great way to stay in touch with, you know, really what it is that makes us all human. Phil, thank you so much for hosting us. Great to be here together. Thank you. Thank you. As they say, art is the reflection, but also could be the solution when we don't have the answers. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Insight, into your search engine. Check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. And have a great weekend.